Thank you. Um, so I'll talk to you about how we, uh, white matter might be uh, some underpinning factor that we haven't studied. And in order to, to trust this, we got the funding from the Paul D. Allen to put together a multidisciplinary team. It's easy to find the people in Cambridge. So uh, we're at the University of Cambridge um, in Cambridge in the UK. It's an idyllic place, easy to find multiple disciplinary people, but excellent in their field. But our first challenge when we started to get the money is to set up a new management agreement a financial setup in an 800 year old institution. However, we managed that, and I think that was probably at least one of the milestones that are most appreciated. So, this team goes across um, a lot of departments and faculties. I think the only two remaining in the University of Cambridge is law and humanities. So, uh, in order, because it's such a vast uh, number of people excellent in their specific fields coming together, we did not mean that we wanted to have individual postdocs that get lost in different labs, but we generated a cloud. The cloud of the postdocs hired on the grant and the research assistants that come together and they feed information between all the different labs, and that way they become the responsible people for the grant. And actually, it's maybe de risking my career. Um, just realized that. Um, but what it makes is that the labs are open to these postdocs, so they go to a location to find the expertise they need to solve a particular question. So, let's go into what are our questions. First, I'm going to give a very brief uh, review of Alzheimer's disease and how it can link to CNS white matter to introduce our hypothesis of where we are looking at this which is basically that white matter dysfunction might be a third factor underpinning Alzheimer's disease. And then I will give you an overview of how we're going to address that hypothesis, which is mainly by generating new uh, technology to study white matter, because that has really been, we needed the tools to ask the question. And just to let you know that this is very exciting preliminary data, we just started in January 2016. So, to start with, first of all, we know that Alzheimer's is the one who identifies the disease it's named after, that there are A beta plaques and tau tangles in neurons that accumulate in the brain and that might lead to the cognitive decline. But at the same time, and less known, is that Oscar Fisher had the same identical discovery and he studied far more people. But in addition to A beta plaques and tau tangles, he also looked at in the white matter, here's a neuronal axon, that you get these swellings. So there are swellings in axons in the white matter. And we've known this now for 100 years. So in our brain, it's actually quite nicely segregated into both gray matter, which is the computational part of our brain, that's where the neuron sits, and white matter. And that's where information is being transmitted. And by using computational analysis, it's been shown that by dividing the brain into these two areas, increases or maximizes neuronal connectivity with the minimum conduction delays. And that gives us the maximum computational power. Yet, when we do a neuroscience, we focus on the, uh, on the gray matter because that's where the neuron is. Well, that's the computational part. So it's all the firing, the excitement. And then the axon, they extend this axon and through the white matter and synapse on the dendritic tree of, uh, of a neuron. But this is taken out of a classical book of neuroscience. And you can see that this tiny bit of axon here, I actually had to extend it. Uh, it's mostly demonstrated as just some kind of feeble thing that hangs out of the neuron. But if you draw this to scale, and I took the liberty of taking maybe the height of Steve, my collaborator, uh, as excited me because I'm too small for effect. So here's a cortical neuron. Now we draw the axon to scale, and you can see it's a huge part of the neuron that is often ignored. And in fact, 99% of this axon is covered with myelin. And in addition to the myelin, our brain also has, in both the white and the gray matter, awful lot of other cells called glial cells. They are not drawn to scale, by the way. So, in order to understand Alzheimer's disease, I think we do have to see it in a more bigger picture. But our focus was on the white matter. And the main cells in the white matter are, of course, 
uh, the oligodendrocytes that wrap the membrane around the axons of the neurons, producing a thick, compact myelin sheath that allows the communication between neurons to be much faster, so limiting the, uh, the, condu you know, the conduction delays. But also, it works as synchronizing the neuronal networks. So not surprising, when myelin is damaged and destroyed or the oligodendrocytes, the propagation of the axon potential slows down or stops altogether as well as synchronization of inputs. So that both leads to cognitive as well as physical disability. Interestingly, when new technology came across with the uh, MRI imaging with 7 Tesla, it became quite clear that there's accumulation of little white matter lesions called microinfracts. And when they're quantified, they find out that these microinfracts in the white matter seem to be quite more numerous in patients with Alzheimer's disease, as well as the severity of the white matter lesions correlate with the cognitive score. So more severe might be the lesion, the worse your cognitive score is. So white matter lesions also interestingly seem to be coming before the onset of clinical symptoms, as well as their severity is correlative. And now very recent data, and I put it on here now because I found it was quite exciting, is that it precedes gray matter atrophy. So what is going on in the white matter? Luckily, our, uh, one of the partners in our team, Michael Coleman, has used in, on to in um, transgenic mice, I that seen uh, a beta accumulation and axonal swellings in the white matter in axons in transgenic animals. Very similar, I hope you agree with me, to the original figure from Oscar Fisher. He also identified that these uh, swellings and the uh, preceed come with a decline in the presynaptic protein expression. So there's a decline in these animals in the presynaptic compartment, which precedes the decline of postsynaptic. So something upstream in the axon could lead to a problem at the synapse. But how does this happen? How can something happen in the axons? Well, oligodendrocytes and the myelin, so 99% of the axon is covered in myelin, and oligodendrocytes that produce the myelin take glucose up, for example, from the uh, blood vessels, transport it to lactate, and have lactate transporter that, talks, that trans gives uh, lactate to the axon in order for the neuron to generate energy that fuels the propagation of action potentials. By knocking out this transporter, for example, has shown that just by defecting the way that the oligodendrocytes feed the axons can lead to axonal swellings, so an axonal damage. In addition, just by manipulating myelin maintenance genes with time will lead to neurodegeneration and microglia activation, as well as in some of the studies looked at that there was cognitive decline and memory loss, so indicating something in the myelin if that is dysfunctional, may lead to a problem in the neuron. But how could this happen? We know that microinfracts are thought to be ischemic, that is, lack of blood supply to that local area. And, uh, well, that's an interesting move. It, there's a lot of things missing on that uh, diagram, I just have to tell you. And, oh, there it is. It's somehow delayed. Anyway, so what happens is that you have a uh, blood loss uh, loss of blood supply locally to the white matter, you will have distortion of the myelin and oligodendrocyte death. And when we mimic this in uh, slices, what we found is that it was the oligodendrocytes that are predominantly dying when you block our glucose and oxygen to the cells compared to other white matter cells. So the oligodendrocytes are very susceptible to changes in blood supply and therefore may feed, have lack of feeding the neuron. So, what could be the consequences when you have myelin dysfunction? We know it can have a loss of a spontaneous synchronized inputs, loss of millisecond precision, reduced conduction velocity when you have problem in the axons, altering long range synchronization, and it can lead to conduction blocks, so communication between neurons completely blocked. Secondary to this myelin dysfunction, you can have an, can lead to axonal degeneration and secondary inflammation. That in turn can also lead to reduced transport of presynaptic proteins, and we found that from Michael Coleman's data that the presynaptic proteins are uh, degrading and also abnormal sprouting. So now you're getting to my hypothesis that 
all of this comes together that if you have a white matter dysfunction, you will, can lead to a cognitive decline. So how is the white matter getting really damaged? We are arguing that microinfrats are due to lack of blood supply and loss of oxygen and glucose. And we know that when the axons and, and the white matter gets loss of, uh, of uh, oxygen and glucose, there might be glutamate and things released from neurons, as well as from other oligodendrocytes and cells in the white matter that attacks the receptors on the, on the myelin. That causes to myelin distortion. And that has an effect to propagation of exponentials, but also may lead to release of proteins like A-beta, and both of this myelin dysfunction as well as A-beta can make the microglia angry. And angry microglia or activated microglia will act, cause more myelin dysfunction as then the conventionally will lead to neurodegeneration. So we have a microinfract and a myelin distortion. That leads to neuronal damage, Le release of A-beta and tau, that can lead to neuronal damage, as well as microglia activation, which itself can lead to more neuronal damage, and activated microglia can affect to produce more white matter infract. So it's a vicious circle, and if we could figure out a way to block it, its path somewhere, we might minimize the impact of the white matter on the disease at least. So to address our hypothesis, we really need to do is to make new technology. So first of all, as we've heard already, it's been really difficult to model this in animals. And in addition to that, most models that we have in transgenic animals use neuronal selective promoters to drive the overexpression of these inserted genes, indicating that we are excluding any involvement of these mutated genes in the glial populations in the brain. So we need a new model of, of the disease with a focus of the white matter. And we need a new technology to study the white matter because so nicely is that the white matter myelin scatters and absorbs light. So it's really annoying in order to try to study. So first of all, we want to model the uh, human grain white matter and able to, in that model, to be able to introduce microinfract. So modeling in humans that we heard previously is using the IPS technology where we can take fibroblasts from people who have the disease and controls and turn them into near in all the cell types that we wish. And that's what we're going to do. And we were lucky to have a collaboration with Karen Graf in the Karolinska Institute which has a bank of fibroblasts with people with multiple different mutations such as APP mutations, the Priscillian mutation and their family members who don't carry the mutation. We can also match them with the controls are matched also for APOE ally and age, which are more major risk factors for the disease. So now we, make, we want to make neurons from the cells, and we're going to correct the mutations of the CRIPR mutation, inserting in the human in the controls and deleting them from the, from the patient line. We're going to make oligodendrocytes and microglia, and then we're going to try to generate a, a model of the gray matter by culturing the neuronal cell bodies in the central compartment of a dish and having the white matter where the axons and the glial cells on the outer side. And this has been done here. You see a nice neuronal clusters in the center of the compartment and lovely axons in the outer compartments. And we are playing also the different uh, set microfluid devices to generate the same thing. We know that our neurons are functional, so they fire extra potentials as well as receive synaptic input, so they're generating network. So we have achieved to generate the neurons. What about the oligodendrocytes? We can generate oligodendrocytes into this myelinating. There are multiple steps of oligodendrocyte differentiation, and we got most of the steps sorted. The myelinating ones are not as pretty as the rodent myelinating ones, which produce a really nice compact myelin. We just think we need a little bit more time to reach that. But I will give myself a credit in saying that we more or less have the oligodendrocytes there. What about the microglia cells? We set up a multiple different routes in order to get microglial cells. At the current, there is no out, uh, proper program from bona fide mic, uh, microglial cells, but they are type of macrophages. So we can drive IPS-derived human microphages, which we have achieved. We also can drive um, microphages from the monocytes of, uh, from the blood. But we recently set up a collaboration with uh, Hunox in Singapore, who actually has made, uh, managed to make uh, the 
bona fide microglia that is generated from the yolk side progenitors. And just to show you now that we can play with these cells in a, like a Lego in a dish, uh, if you could play the movie, please. Just quickly. You see that the, the microglia cells, human microglia cells are here in red. The neurons, cortical neurons, are in uh, bright field. And I just wanted to highlight, we are always seeing these microglia cells bossing the neurons around, actually taking them and translocating them to a different area on the dish. I don't know why and what is the functional reason for this, but I hope we will find out. And uh, so we have the microglial cells. I think I'm running out of time here. So we have modeling of the microinfrax in our dish is to generate electrode that scavenges the oxygen in one compartment but leaving the other compartment a normal oxygen and uh, causing the distortion of the myelin. We've tested these electrodes that we've generated in a model with bacteria. There's anaerobic bacteria that grow and produce lactate acid in, uh, in low oxygen conditions. And when they have the scavengers on, we have a similar output as to the zero oxygen environment. So we have the scavenger working. And now uh, we have to get the advanced technology. And uh, in order to study really what's happening in the white matter. And uh, here we have the axon and the myelin, which is 99, co 99 covering the axon. And uh, what is happening in this area, I think, might be a very important one. And I give Stephen Lee to give you uh, the technological uh, advance. Thanks, Laura. Green button. Great. So, hello, everyone. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm a, my background's a not a, a uh, neurophysiologist. I'm a, I'm a physical chemist. And so, what gets me out of bed in the morning is developing new tools to address biological questions. So, primarily things like, and this is an excellent example of one, of how the, the kind of periaxonal space uh, in these myelinated axons is in a spatial regime that's much smaller than optical microscopy can image. It's very useful for things like electron microscopy, but they're kind of limited. So, just to kind of motivate you slightly. If you imagine taking a log uh, spatial plot right from the kind of angstrom up to the kind of complex cellular and, uh, and the kind of anatomy of an, uh, of a, uh, of an individual uh, neuron d down through these, these spatial scales and you kind of overlay uh, on top of that the type of tools which are typically used to probe that spatial regime. You see up at this end you've got really excellent uh, tools that can address you know, molecular problems. I find it really interesting that uh, uh, structural biology can tell me that a, a sulfur atom is 6.32 angstroms away from a carbon atom, but it tells me nothing about how an enzyme or a process works. So we wanted to really try to visualize these things. And at the other end, you have optical microscopy that gives you great information about dynamics in cellular environments, but is limited by what the so-called diffraction limit, uh, which uh, is a kind of innate blurriness of light, which means that if you keep magnifying and magnifying your image, on some level it's going to be uh, limited not by the engineering of your microscope, but actually the diffraction of light itself. And this was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2014 and so-called super resolution imaging. And so we've been kind of developing that and trying to apply that to this problem of white matter damage uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So this is a simulation of the, type, the, of the type of spatial regimes we're looking at here, but the periaxonal space is typically about 40 or 50 nanometers in, in, in size. So we have to use uh, multicolored 3D live cell super resolution microscopy to be able to address that, um, which is currently what we're kind of trying to develop. And part of that process, uh, this is a simulation, but the simulation is built upon real data that's taken in the lab uh, of the type of images that we may be able to start to, start to be able to generate uh, in this kind of general scheme where we're seeing this kind of damage to the myelin, which is ultimately leading to, 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 to neuronal death. Um, so uh, preliminary, we've been developing a, a tool by targeting uh, fluorescent molecules directly to, in this case, uh, neurofilament uh, by using DNA. Um, that's going to allow us multicolor imaging. We've shown this works. Uh, this is actually based upon the ability to image single dye molecules. Actually, you can't really see this in this image, uh, which is show, goes testament to the, the, the postdoc that did it, but there's about a million localizations that go into building up that image. Um, and we're typically uh, attaining resolutions, uh, localization uh, precisions of around 10 to 20 nanometers at the moment. Uh, although we're, we can actually use these tools to start to look at. So initially I showed you some, some uh, neuronal imaging. This is actually tau. Uh, we've got a resolution of not only being able to, re to resolve single tau monomers, but also aggregates of them, so-called oligomers, and then finally into these kind of fibrils. And so what we're hoping to do in the future is combine um, that kind of aggregate imaging 
uh, with uh, kind of uh, 3D uh, spatial imaging to actually see is can we actually visualize these processes? And I think that's a real key problem is if you can see it, then I think there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of questions that can be answered simply by addressing can we optically detect it. So in summary, I'm going to hand back to Thora. Well, <coughs> this is just really quick. So we think that hopefully convincing the white matter may be an underlying factor. So that because the white matter leaves in occur before the clinical signs and correlate with cognitive impairment, axonal swellings can occur before decline in cognitive function, white matter dysfunction precedes AB centaur aggregation, and oligodendrocytes, myelin, are metabolic supporting the neuron, and they, as, which is needed for normal neuronal circuit. The loss of myelin and myelin integrity leads to axonal swelling and neuronal degeneration, and therefore, white matter integrity needs to be investigated, I would argue, in uh, the context of AD, and I hope I also convinced you now, we finally we got the tools to do it. It's just about getting back to the lab and doing the experiments. So thank you uh, all. So this is the team, and uh, yeah, if you're happy to have questions. Questions? Well, how, yeah. does the, how does the sort of vascular theory of how does a uh, vascular theory of the white matter disease, disease, how does that relate to sort of, you know, vascular disease of old age in general? Sometimes people with a lot of vascular disease get Alzheimer's, sometimes they don't, uh, and, you know, like that. Well, uh, I, I, would, I, I would argue almost so extensively, I think, all dementias would have some vascular component to it. And I think there's, a, I mean, it's not just me, there's a lot of people who are studying vesicular dementia and who are studying Alzheimer's disease, and there's a lot of overlap between. Of course, there are, there are extremes in the two ends, but the amount of overlap, I, th I, I think that this may be one of the uh, reasons why you start to have the symptoms so at, late, at a, a late age, uh, 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 when you're older. Because the, the cardiovascular system and the blood supply to the brain declines with age. So there might be just a threshold of decline in some patients who are more susceptible to this uh, diminished oxygen and uh, glucose supply by the blood, and they will have uh, started either the white matter lesions and a lot of cascade of uh, things that happened in the brain that can lead to, the, to dementia or Alzheimer's disease.